So as we know, the fisheries industry has been doing it tough over the last decade. Prices have been down, costs are up, and profitability as a consequence has been suffering. So, so today I'm going to talk about three things surrounding this general theme. First, the global trends affecting fisheries and what's driving these. Then the medium term outlook for the sector. And finally, I'll provide some useful indicators for monitoring the economic performance of Australian fisheries. Economic indicators are not only applicable to the Commonwealth fisheries to which I'll be showing them today, but also to the fisheries sector in general. So on the plus side, <laughs> a rising world population is driving up seafood consumption. So perhaps what less well known is that consumption at a per person level is also rising. So changing demographics is what's driving this trend. Countries are getting richer, urbanisation is increasing, and age profiles are changing, all of which together are leading to changes in consumer preferences. As you can see here, most consumption is in, is in developing countries where the population is greatest. In, the, in these countries, the seafood consumption mix is changing towards greater consumption of processed products, as it is the case in developed countries. Since 2000, the share of processed fisheries products in these countries has risen from around 36% to 41%. So this trend is some way to go yet. One last thing about consumption. There's a big difference in the importance fish makes to diets across countries. So in our key export markets of Japan, United States and Europe, fish consumption is higher than the world average, roughly around 20 kilograms per person and just under 60 kilograms in Japan, which is quite an important market for us. This contrasts with developing countries where the global average is more around 14 kilograms per person. So given the rise in population and the rise in consumption, it's no surprise that global production is also rising. Here though, there's a story to tell about aquaculture. Aquaculture is essentially filling a gap from a stalling of wild catch production with its share increasing over time and sitting now at around 37%. This, of course, is increasing competition for exporters to the region, particularly exporters of aquacultural produced goods such as crustacea species. As is well known to Australian prawn exporters, lower prices in Asia from competition with aquaculture produced forms is the norm nowadays, and this competition is also felt in the domestic market from our, our own aquaculture sector. So this I'll touch on a little bit later. So now looking at trade. It turns out that 38% of fisheries production is traded across international borders. This of course is good news for, for Australian exporters. Asia continues to be a huge market for most of our most valuable species like rock lobster, abalone and tuna. Europe's currently the fastest growing market for imported product but this market tends to import a lot from itself. North America, on the other hand, is a fairly mature market with little growth occurring. But together, these regions give Australian producers plenty of choice, with trade for most categories of fisheries production increasing. However, as in the past, our regional export focus is likely to remain on Asia. Challenging to the local industry, over the last decade has been a trend decline in global prices of fisheries products. Australian wild catch prawn industry has experienced the brunt of this decline, with the decline in world price of crustaceans directly linked to increased aquaculture production in Asia. In contrast, the, pros the price, international price of mollusks and fish species has been more stable. So that's pretty much, uh, in a nutshell, what's been happening globally. So now I'll talk a little bit about the local scene. Production volumes, and that's not what's shown here, this is values. Production volumes have fallen slightly in the last decade, but the mix of species produced in Australia has changed. Production of some high-value species like wild-caught prawns, rock lobster and tuna is down, while aquaculture's production is increasing its share of the mix with a sustained rise in the production of salmon and tuna. It's different for production value though, where there's been a significant trend decline in value over time. The key driver here has been the appreciation of the Australian dollar from around 50 cents in 2000-2001 to around about parity nowadays. 
and the negative impact that this has had on beach prices for the industry. Beach prices have fallen most for our export species and those where international aquaculture competition is greatest. This figure here gives us a closer look. In general, beach prices are down most for prawns and tuna. In contrast, beach prices for rock lobster have been rising since 2004-05 as a result of tighter supply and a strong Asian demand for live lobster. At a species level, the impact of both price and production changes, of course, impacts on value. Lower prices have essentially halved earnings from prawns in the last 10 years. However, for rock lobster and tuna, lower production volumes has been a key driver, with the volumes of these species down by around 60% over the decade. In contrast, the rise of salmon production volume has increased fin fish species production value. On the trade front, Australia is a net importer of fisheries products in volume and value terms now. This reflects the appreciation of the Australian dollar, which has made exports less competitive and increased import competition in our local market. Also, changing demographics in Australia with Australia's rising population and the change in the mix of the population is increasing seafood consumption. Imports to date are mainly sourced from New Zealand and Thailand but imports from Vietnam and China are increasing also. Now looking at the trade mix. We export mainly high value products like rob lo lobster, pearls, abalone and tuna, with rock lobster remaining our most valuable export. In contrast, Australia imports lower value products like frozen fillets and canned products. Looking at the destination of our major exports, there's an interesting story here. Over half our exports are now sent to Hong Kong, which is a big change on a decade ago, when it was Japan, which was our most important export destination in terms of value. This trend towards Hong Kong being an important market is unlikely to change over the outlook period. So given all this, what is the outlook for fisheries production? In the past, this outlook has been strongly influenced by exchange rate movements, as shown in this figure. So given the assumed appreciation of the Australian dollar, which we heard about this morning, over the medium term, the outlook is for some modest improvement in unit export prices and beach prices. Given this, Australia's value of fisheries production is forecast to steadily rise in real terms over the period to 2015-16. This is quite an important point because this contrasts dramatically with the period of decline that the industry has just come through. So while the boost to earnings from a lower dollar is of course good news for the industry, there are other factors out there that will keep profitability under pressure. Higher fuel prices and tight labour markets are unlikely to ease up any time soon. Competitive pressures from producing regions outside Australia will of course continue. These are things we cannot change. So given this, it's important that we focus on areas where we can make a difference. One area is management. Management of fisheries should be as cost effective as possible and fishing effort applied to fisheries needs to be consistent with achieving maximum economic returns from the catch. This is the so-called economic objective of fisheries management. And this objective is increasingly being incorporated in management of fisheries across Australia. To ensure that maximising returns is being met, measurement tools are obviously needed. So gross value of fisheries production, what we have been looking at up to now, is of course one such tool. But apart from helping us to monitor the trends of activity over time, it tells us very little about the economic returns in the industry and how these returns are changing. So other indicators can help here. For example, direct measurement of economic returns through industry surveys, a thing that ABES does um, quite habitually for Commonwealth fisheries. Productivity indicators and measuring the factors that contribute most to profitability. In the next few slides, I will show you some examples of these 
indicators, all of which come from the Commonwealth trawl sector and the southern and eastern scalfish and of the southern and eastern scalfish shark fishery, a fishery that's closely monitored by ABES. I'll br briefly take you through each, but before that, I'll give you just a few facts about the fishery. So this is the area we're talking about, off the coast of South East Australia, an area extending from Baron Joey Point, just north of Sydney, around Tasmania to Jervis Bay in South Australia. The Commonwealth trawl sector is one of the largest Commonwealth fisheries, supplying a range of fresh fish to the domestic market, both in Sydney and Melbourne. The main fishing method is bottom trawling, so fuel input costs are important to this fishery and, it's a, and make up a high proportion of operating costs. A range of finfish species are caught, with the main species being blue grenadier and tiger flathead currently, but this of course changes over time. The red areas in the map show where fishing activity is greatest, with the main areas being located off Eden in New South Wales and Lake Centrance and Portland in Victoria. This sector has been through an extended period of restructuring, following the introduction of total allowable catch limits in the sector in 2001 and the completion of the buyback of Commonwealth licences in 2006, which reduced fishing, concession, which reduced fishing concessions from around 90 to 52 in 78. So here we can see the economic returns of a fishery mapped out over a number of years and it's an indicator that ABS tracks every two years. As can be seen here, low, in fact negative economic returns for a string of years were experienced early in the last decade. Returns have recovered somewhat following a period of structural adjustment in the late 2000s. So this particular indicator is important for monitoring trends in economic performance over time which is important to know, but it gives little insight as to why the trends are changing. This indicator is also important because it provides the base survey data for the next two indicators, indicators that I'll share with you today. It's important to note that these indicators are just examples of what, what's possible. 